We'll get started. Good morning, everybody. We're glad you're here. This is the Mac Road uh, Church of Christ parking lot service. We're still having to meet in our parking lot because supposedly we're still in the purple as far as the pandemic uh, colors go. And so we're still meeting in our parking lots. Good to see you all here. We have a full parking lot and a, a number of people are here. So we're glad that the Lord's blessed you to be here this morning with us. If you're listening on online, remember you need a, a the Lord's Supper, some unleavened bread, and uh, you can sing along with the songs. If you're, you're watching this on the video, if you're listening to it, you'll need some songbooks so you can sing along with us, or maybe you already know the songs. Uh, welcome, and we hope that God blesses you. Remember that it's our responsibility as parents to make sure that our children are listening to the Word of God, or at least studying, or we're reminding them of it when they go to bed at night and we read them stories, or we pray with them, or we remind them that God loves them, or it, when we're having breakfast and lunch and dinner, and we, we pray to God, and, and so keep your children in mind, and Brother Sandy says that he found a uh, appropriate uh, video for the kids for the fiery furnace, and so um, if you're on his email address, you should be able to get that from him, and if not, make sure you get on him, because he's got a lot of uh, good resources for children in order to help you so that you can help them and watch a video and then talk, talk with them about it. And we hope you're doing that. We hope that each of you are doing that, whether you have grandkids or whether you have your own kids. We pray that you're doing that and, and helping them and developing them, because that's one of the ways that we can spread the word when we spread it to our, to our children and our families. All right, we're going to be singing song number eight. If anybody else needs the Lord's Supper or the papers, honk one last time, and uh, they'll get it for you. Uh, somebody over, I heard somebody honk, so somebody needs one. We're going to be singing song number eight. If you would, it's uh, glory to his name. Here we go. No.
Brother Morito. Good morning. Glad that everybody's here and uh, <clears throat> hope you'll join me to uh, pray to the Lord. Our Father, almighty heart in heaven, we're so thankful for this wonderful day that you have given us to be able to come together and worship you and glorify you and give thanks to all the blessings that you have showered on each and every one of us. We're so thankful for the wonderful gift of life that we have, the material and spiritual blessings that we enjoy. We thank thee most of all for sending your beloved son down to earth to show us the way of eternal life. We are so thankful for everything that you have given us, this congregation where we come every week to give thanks to you. We pray, Father, that you will be with us as we go through life and enjoy the blessings that you have. We pray that you be with those that are sick and suffering, those that are in challenging times, driven to suffer this COVID. We pray that you be with them as well, especially those that have lost loved ones, those that are taking care of them, we pray that you be with them as well. We pray, Father, that you be with Mike as he delivers a portion of your word that will be able to discern and understand your way of salvation. We pray, Father, that you give us the strength to go on in life and enjoy everything. We pray that you be with the leaders of this land, that they'll continue to govern us righteously so that we'll be able to spread your word into some other lands as well. We pray, Father, that you be with our children. We pray that you be with our families and relatives as well, that they too will be able to be able to hear your word and glorify thee. We ask that you be with every one of us this morning, that we will be able to concentrate on your word and continue to live with thee and serve thee most of all. We ask that you be always with us and be forgiving of our many sins. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll be singing song number 154. 154.
hopefully you were able to take the uh, little wrapper off the top of your communion cup so that you can partake of the Lord's Supper with us. We're going to be eating the bread in just a minute. But as we do that, let me remind you of what it represents for us. You know, in our Luke study, we're talking about the Lord's uh, Supper and the institution of the Lord's Supper. And we notice that it's set in the background of the Old Testament Passover. If you remember what that Passover was about, that was about when the children of Israel were in, in Egyptian captivity and God sent Moses to deliver them. And God was going to deliver them with the last plague, which was the what we refer to as the death of the firstborn. <clears throat> and if they took a, a lamb and they prepared it the way God wanted them to, and they took some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of their house, then when the angel would see it, he would pass over that house and the firstborn in that house would be able to live. The firstborn represents that which belongs to God. God always gets the first of everything. That's why they gave him a tithe, and that's the reason they also uh, uh, gave him the firstborn of the cattle and the firstborn of the, their crop or the first fruit of their crop, because God gets the firstborn of everything, and it represents his people. And so the deliverance of God's people is not simply because they're God's people, because the firstborn of Egypt died, and the reason the firstborn of Egypt died and the firstborn of every other group that was there died was because they didn't administer the sacrifice in the way that God told them to for the purpose of delivering them when God saw them. And that's what the Lord's Supper is about. It's about the fact that we have to have the right sacrifice in order for us to approach God. It's not just enough for us to be nice people and religious people. We need to be individuals that have been that have applied the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus to our hearts. They put their blood on the doorposts of their house where they live. Well, we're spiritual people and we live in our bodies. And that blood is applied to our heart so that when Jesus or God sees that blood, he'll know that we're one of his faithful and he'll save us as being one of his firstborn. And so when you eat the bread, that's reminding us of the body of Jesus, reminding us of the fact that he, he was the one who died for us so that through him, we might, we might have fellowship with God. And through his sacrifice, we can therefore fulfill our role in being his people. So as we get ready to eat the bread, and we're going to ask Brother Laredo to lead us in a prayer on behalf of the bread. Eternal Lord of heaven, we are so thankful for being able to come together this morning and partake this emblem that represents the body of your son, Jesus Christ, who was hanging on the cross and suffered so much for the redemption of our mankind. We're so thankful that he willingly went to the cross and followed your will so that mankind will be able to learn your eternal way of salvation. We pray, Father, that as we partake this, we remember that your son have so much to have given us everything that we need so that we'll be able to follow thy will. We pray, Father, that you continue to bless us and give you thanks for giving us this opportunity to worship and glorify your son. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Along with the Passover lamb, they would also drink. And when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he took that drink. And he said that this drink represents the blood of the new covenant. That covenant that has paid for every single sin that anybody has committed from the patriarchal period to the mosaic period to the church period. 
And it's by the blood of that sacrifice that God is able to keep his covenant, whether he made it in the Old Testament, whether he made it in the law of Moses, or whether he made it with us today. God can keep his covenant of being gracious to us and merciful to us and help us because Jesus' blood paid for our sins so that God in his righteousness would be able to be just as he would be a justifier for us who are sinners. So as we get ready to drink of this cup that reminds us of the blood of Jesus that makes that possible, I'm going to ask Troy, if he would, to lead us in a blessing. Morning, I love you. Shall we pray? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come here and worship you. I ask you, Lord, that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, that we examine ourselves, look towards you, and, and that you will open our eyes to walking in the ways that you would want us to walk in. We thank you, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, that this fruit of the vine that we partake in, that will, that will nourish our bodies and our minds and keep us focused in remembering what you have done for us. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Though that concludes the simple memorial of the sacrifice of Jesus, it doesn't conclude the attitude that we should have. Because Jesus and God and the Spirit were willing to come down to bless us, to give us everything that we need. And the Bible says that Jesus became poor, that we might become rich. And so as we are God's people, then we certainly understand that it's not the possessions of this world that are important to us, though we need them and God says he'll provide those for us. What's important is for us to share what we have with those that are in need for those that are less fortunate than we are. And we do that by sharing our time, by speaking them about the, the word of God, by helping them if they have trouble, by taking over food to those who are sick, by clothing those who are naked and by helping those who are diseased or infirmed. We also do that by sharing the resources that we have, whether it's our car or our home, or whether it's our financial resources. And so this is one of those times that we get an opportunity to share. And we do it not for the purpose of being saved, but because we are God's people. And just like Jesus willingly gave up for us, we willingly give up for others. And so if, if you're giving today, and if you're giving to the cause of the, the church and spreading the gospel and supporting the work that's being done here. We pray that God blesses you and that you can do it cheerfully. But we also pray that you remember that our sharing doesn't stop here. This is just the first part of it, you might say. We should share our lives with everyone. So let's pray if you, if you would bow down with me. Brother Brian. I like to give hugs and I like to give uh, I love yous. And I love giving a portion of my first fruits back to the Lord. I pray that we all will give back today with a cheerful heart, with a loving heart, in the spirit of God in our minds. Thank you so much, Lord, for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. May we give back to you free and willing to show our love and our appreciation for all the things you give us. Thank you, Lord. In, some, in, in your son's name, I pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, bro. Next song we'll be singing is 420. 420 will be the next song we'll be singing. If you have a Bible, you might open it up to uh, John. We'll be looking at John chapter 1 as we're continuing our study and also in Exodus. So if you'd open up the book of Exodus to chapter 33. Song number 420, Oh, That Founds of Every Blessing. John chapter 1. Our reading is taken from John chapter 1 in verse 14. I want to thank uh, Brother Larry for the songs that he picked out. And I want to thank Brother Ben for putting that, the vocals to it. We appreciate him doing that during this time uh, when we have a hard time with our song leaders because it's difficult for them to just sing in here by themselves. And that's the reason that we have those songs. We want to thank Ben for doing that. And thank all of you for all of the different ways that you contribute to the cause of Christ and to the way that the uh, church gets to function together as a group of people. And we appreciate our deacons who always serve you guys. And so we're in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 14, and it reads, <clears throat> and, the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, we've been looking at the fact that the word became flesh is what we're going to look at today. But we've been looking at, at the fact that God cares about this world and that he created the world and that the world rejected him. So what is he to do? He loves the world. He loves his creation. He loves his people. He tried to do everything he could to get his people to believe in him, to trust him. He spoke with Adam and Eve in the garden. He, he manifested himself in the Old Testament, and yet people didn't believe him, or they didn't understand him properly. And so what he decided to do was become part of our world. Let me remind you of what we've already covered. The Word was God, and the Word was with God, and he created everything. And he was the life of men, and the life was the light of men. He blesses us and gives us everything. And so... Since the world rejected him, God didn't give up on us. Maybe people have given up on you. Maybe you used to be an individual, or maybe you still are an individual that does things that you shouldn't do, and so people have given up on you. Well, the world had done things that God didn't like. The Bible says that we were enemies of God, but yet God didn't give up. What God did was he became flesh. And 
the only way I can describe this or the best way to think about this is if you have some kind of a pets that you just love and you adore. And some people spend thousands of dollars on their pets, getting their teeth cleaned and their and, and you know going to the vet and, and making sure that they have all their shots. They just love their pets. And if they saw their pet doing something or had the habit of doing something and they couldn't stop them because maybe the pet didn't understand. Well, could you imagine loving them so much that you decide to become like them so that you can lead them away from danger or help them? That's what God did. That's what God's done to the world. The world is God's and he wants it. He wants everybody in it. And he's become flesh in verse 14. That what we're looking, we're going to look at verse 14 because there's just so much in here. It says, and the word became flesh. He became flesh, let me suggest to you, because of man's attitude towards him. There's, there's two kinds, there's basically two attitudes that man, man has against God or about God. One is that man becomes arrogant and thinks he doesn't need God. But the other group, the majority of the group, is fearful of God. You look at all the stories of the Greek gods. You look at how the Greek gods would, would torture people or would, would manipulate people. And so no wonder people were afraid of God. Remember when Paul uh, and, and Silas had healed that lame man and the uh, priests of, of, of Zeus wanted to sacrifice to him. And they wanted to, the reason they wanted to sacrifice to him was because there was this, this myth that the gods had come down and the people ignored them. And so the gods sent earthquakes and plagues and, uh, on the land. And so when they saw a Paul with the power to be able to heal somebody, they wanted to make sure that God wouldn't get mad at them. And so they came down to offer sacrifice and Paul had to stop them and say, "That's you don't know our God. You don't know the God who created the world. Man has always been fearful of God. Remember in Judges chapter 22 with Gideon, the story of Gideon? If you don't know the story of Gideon, you need to go read it. But Gideon was commissioned by God to, to knock down some idols that were in the center of his city. And as God appeared to him in verse 22, it says of Judges 6, he says, when Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. You see, Gideon was afraid that because he saw the angel of God, he was going to die. Because that's our reaction when it comes to God. And you remember when God called Sam, uh, uh, Samson? You remember Samson, guy with the long hair, Delilah? Remember that story? When God talked to his parents, it says in uh, Judges chapter 13 and verse 22, so Manoah said to his wife, we will surely die for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hand, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. So man has always been afraid of, of meeting God because we know we're going to die. We're not going to be able to to see God and spend time with God and be with God because God is greater than we are and we know he's going to kill us. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, talking about the reason Jesus became flesh, says, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all, uh, were subject to slavery all their lives. He said, we were fearful of death and the reason we're fearful of death is because we know that we're going to have to meet God. At least people who believe in God know they're going to have to meet him. And they're afraid to meet him. They're afraid to meet God because of all the different concepts that you have in the world of, of how God is. And so what happened when Adam and Eve sinned? What did they do in the garden after they sinned? In Genesis 3 and verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What did they do? They hid themselves. They said, we don't want to stand before God, so we're going to hide. We're going to, we're, we're going to hide among the trees. We're going to hide from, from God as if we can hide from God. Man has always been afraid of God. And maybe that's one of the reasons why man doesn't want to accept God because he's afraid of him. But the word came to live among them. 
It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived among us. <clears throat> God has always wanted to live among us. From the very beginning, in the, in the garden, he's wanted to live among us. But how can God live among us? How can he do that? In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20, we're going to read that in just a minute. But one verse says, Moses wanted to see God's face, but God said, you cannot see my face for, for man cannot see me and live. So how can God live among us if we can't see him? And, it, and if God is here, we're going to die. If all of a sudden you were transported to where God is in the state that we are right now, and we saw God, we would die. Because of how we're made, we would die. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and, and verse 16, he says, Who alone possesses immortality, talking about God, and dwells in unapproachable light, who no man can see or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So how in the world can God dwell among us if we can't see him? If he's with us, we're going to be killed. We're going to die just because of his nature and the way he is and the way we are. How can he live among us? How can he actually come down here? You know, God manifested himself in a number of different ways in the Old Testament. He, number, he manifested himself in the tabernacle where he was supposed to where he was supposed to live. And so there were things like you can't look into it or else you'll die. Or you can't touch it unless you're a priest or else you'll die. By the way, we should have got a hint there because God says we can touch it if we're priests. If we're Levites, we can touch it. We can approach him. But he says we can't approach God. So how in the world can God dwell among us? How can he become flesh? Well, the answer is, is God had to leave some of God in order for him to approach us, in order for us to be with him. God had to empty himself. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, that means that the word was God. He was just as much God as the Father was. So one of our problems when, when we talk about Jesus is we talk about Jesus, the Son of God, and it implies the idea of the Son of God. It implies that he was created or he was made by the Father, and so therefore he's less than the Father because the Father made him or created him to be a son, and that's the way we look at sons because that's the way sons come in our world. Son, sons come as a result of their fathers doing something. But you have to remember that we're talking about before Jesus became flesh. Before Jesus became flesh, he was never known as the Son of God. He was the Word. He was equal to the Father. He was equal to the Spirit. They were equal to one another. He was God. And so it says, did not God equal uh, equality with God a thing to be grasped? So even though he existed in the exact quality of God, he wasn't going to hold on to that exact quality of God at the sake of or at the expense of losing the world. Do you understand that? That he was God. And yet what he's telling us is, is that he's giving up some of that in order for him to come down here to help us, in order for him to come down here and aid us, his people, who are afraid of him, who don't understand him, who are fearful of him, or who don't want to accept him because we think he's some arrogant individual, and so therefore we deny him. And he was willing to give up some of who he was to come down here. Now, I know what we're thinking as soon as I say that. We're thinking that he wasn't God. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But the Bible says, and I want you to, I want you to understand it, that Paul was inspired by God when he says that although he existed in the form of God, he did that regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He emptied himself. You know what keeps us arguing when we have disagreements with people sometimes? 
that we're not willing to give up our position. We're not willing to empty ourselves of what we think in order to make peace. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not saying that we give up the, the values of God or truth. But I'm talking about our position or our stand or what it is that we want. And our pride and arrogance keeps us from doing that. And though God is God, he was not so proud and he was not so arrogant, not that, not that he is at all, but he's not proud and arrogant because he's willing to give up whatever he needs to in order to love people, in order to help us. And it says, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself. And the reason that he emptied himself is because if you remember when when Solomon was building the tabernacle uh, or the temple, you remember? He said, Lord, I know you can't live in a house. I know you can't live in a building. So do you think God can live in a physical body and that physical body can contain everything that God is? The answer is no. But, it, but when we say that, we think, well, then Jesus wasn't God. He was. We're going to talk about that. He said, but he emptied himself in taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He was made like us. He was made like us. He wasn't made somebody who was without sin when we all were made in sin. You know, there's a religious theology today that's called Calvinism. Calvinism teaches that you were born in sin. And if we're born in sin, then in order for Jesus to, to deliver me, he has to be born in sin. But Jesus wasn't born in sin. That's because we weren't born in sin. He was made just like us. The difference is, is we chose to sin and he didn't. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus was willing to die according to the definition that we have of die in our world. He was willing to do that. God can't die, but he was willing to do that so that he could save us. He's willing to give that up. And that's the reason why it says we as God's people need to have this exact same attitude. We need to stop being so arrogant that we think the reason we're getting to heaven is because we got it all right. Jesus was right. And he gave up part of the power of God to come down here to live among us, and to help us understand who God is. And that explains why the Bible says some rather weird things about Jesus that we have a hard time understanding. You know, Luke, in, when Jesus was 12 years old, you remember that? It says that after all of that happened, he went home and he grew in wisdom and stature and favor in God and men. Well, how could God grow? Doesn't God know everything? Doesn't God know, have all the power of everything? How does he grow? Well, when he emptied himself, he can now grow. He was a man, and just like a man, we have to grow, and we have to develop. And Jesus didn't know everything. Remember when the disciples asked him about, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to God? He says, I don't know that. My father knows. What do you mean you don't know Jesus? Aren't you God? Well, yeah, he's God. But he willingly gave some things up. And we have Bible verses that tell us that Jesus became tired. Jesus became hungry. Jesus was weary. Jesus had to sit down and rest. God has to rest? No. But when God becomes a man, he does because man has to rest. And that explains passages like John chapter 14 and verse 28, where Jesus is talking with his disciples and he says, you heard that I said to you that I go away and I will come to you 
If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And you, and you say, well, how can God be greater than God? Well, that's because when Jesus said this, Jesus was saying, I, God, the man. The Father is greater than me. And you might say, well, how does that work? And I don't know exactly how I can tell you, but, you know, I, I like Dr. Pepper. And what I like about Dr. Pepper is that I can go to the store and I can buy me a bottle of Dr. Pepper. And I can take that Dr. Pepper bottle and I can drink it. And it's Dr. Pepper, as much as Dr. Pepper is Dr. Pepper, that bottle of Dr. Pepper is Dr. Pepper. It's not Coke, it's not Pepsi, it's not Sprite, it's Dr. Pepper. And every part of that, every part of that Dr. Pepper is Dr. Pepper. And everything in that bottle is Dr. Pepper. Everything. But when I drink it and it's gone, Dr. Pepper is not gone. Why Dr. Pepper is in every store you can think of. So even though I have Dr. Pepper, there is Dr. Pepper that is greater than the Dr. Pepper I have in my hand. It's not greater because it's something, it's not greater because it's Pepsi. It's greater because the Dr. Pepper that I'm drinking is not all the Dr. Pepper that there is. And when Jesus says the Father is greater than I am, he's saying there's more to God than just in me. Just like there's more Dr. Pepper than there is in that bottle. But that bottle is full of Dr. Pepper. And it's just as much Dr. Pepper as if I had 10,000 gallons of it. That's what Jesus means when he says the Father is greater than I am. Because Jesus was still God. He was still God, even though he gave up something to come down here. In Colossians 2 and verse 9, it says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In that vessel, in that Jesus, was God. Just as much God as God the Father was, as God the Spirit is. He's God. He's just as much God as they are. Even though he says the Father is greater than I am, there's more out there than just what you see and hear. But everything in that body was God. Now, here's an interesting thing. What that tells us is, is that God and who God is has the attitude and the disposition that if he has to give something up, for the purpose of helping his creation or those whom he loves, he will do it because he's God. And when he gives it up, it doesn't make him any less God. That's what Jesus did. And that's why it says, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And so God... The word dwelt among us. And verse 14 says, And we saw his, his glory. We saw his glory. Now, that's an interesting statement. And the reason I say that's an interesting statement is because the Bible says that no man has seen God. And we're assuming no man has seen the full glory of God. But yet the Bible says we've seen the glory of God. If you see Jesus, we, we saw his glory. Well, what kind of glory did he have? Well, what was it that Jesus loved to do? And what is it that God loves to do? Because when you talk about glory, you're not just talking about light or radiance that comes from somebody. Everybody out here in the audience right now, each one of us, has something that we glory in, something that we like, some talent that God has given us that he's given us that we can live with and that we enjoy using. And, and, and we love using it. And people say, hey, can you come over? Troy, I know, likes working on cars. I don't know whether he likes to, but he's good at it. And Troy, and even his son works on cars. And people come say, hey, Troy, can you work on my car? And Troy goes, sure, I'll, I'll be happy to work on your car. He likes doing that. That's part of who Troy is. 
And some of you like to bake. Lourdes loves to cook and Pedro loves to cook and they have some of the best food. And that's one of the things that we remember about them is that the Sanchez's can cook and Tiny can sing. And he's got that deep bass voice. And my wife loves sending cards to people. And she writes nice notes in them. And, and, and she sometimes gets upset because when she sends a note, she always adds my name because she loves me. And she adds my name and people say, Mike, thanks for the card. And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> so if you get a card from me, it's probably my wife. <laughs> And that's one of the talents she has. So when we talk about the glory, we're not talking about his radiance or, or, or the way he looked or the vain attitudes that some people have when they look in the mirror and they think that's who they are. And so they wanna have long eyelashes and makeup on and colored faces so that they look wonderful. I'm talking about guys when I say that. And, 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 and they, 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 they do all that and they think that's who they are. Well, that's the way you look. When we talk about the fact that we saw God's glory, we're not talking about the way he looked. We're talking about what God loves to do, what he enjoys. And what was it that Jesus loved to do? Well, first of all, he came into this world because he loved us. And it says in Acts 10 and verse 38, and you know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how did he use his power? Did he go around blowing things up? Did he go around making people disappear who didn't agree, who didn't agree with him? Did he, did he make people change their mind without their own will or their own uh, desire? What was it that he did that he had all this power now? It says, and how he went about doing good and healing people. He didn't build giant skyscrapers. He didn't build large monuments. He helped people. He healed people that were sick and were trapped by the devil. He helped people with addictions. He helped people who were demon possessed. He helped people who didn't understand the value of life and maybe had killed somebody or boarded their child. Jesus came to do good. God has always wanted to do good. God has always wanted to help. That's why he created Adam and even put him in the garden. He wanted to share with them the blessings that he had. There's no other reason for God to have made us. except that he wants to bless us. And it says he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Why did he do that? For God was with him. And let me suggest to you, was in him. You see, when God is in us, when God dwells in us, then we do good. We love our husbands, we love our wives, even, in the, even with the faults that we know that they have, we love them if God is with us. And if you're Republicans, you love the Democrats. And if you're Democrats, you love the Republicans. And if you're independents, I guess you gotta love everybody. If God is in you, then we go about doing good. And that's what we saw in Jesus. We saw him doing good. And you might say, but Mike, I've seen God punish people. Well, yeah, but what kind of people does he punish? People are rebellious and who don't want to serve him. And even in his punishment, he's kind and gracious. But he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And he never threatened anybody. People lied about him, and he never threatened them. People spoke bad about him, he never threatened them. People injured him, he never threatened them. Boy, you hurt me, and I'll tell you. 
some things. You cut in front of me in the grocery line and I have some wicked thoughts for you. You hurt my, you hurt my family and the wrath of God will come on you. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, who committed no sin, there was any deceit found in his mouth. He didn't do a thing wrong, nothing. And verse 23 says, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. You know, it's amazing how he died on that cross. He never looked down on the people and said, what a bunch of idiots. He never said, you're going to get yours. He never said, I can't wait till the day of judgment and you guys receive what you're going to get. I say those kind of things. Jesus doesn't. He had no, no threats. What did he do then? How did he survive? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Have you, have you ever willingly been hurt by somebody in an effort to help them? That's what God did. He willingly was hurt. He willingly died to help somebody. See, we don't mind helping people as long as we get the credit for it. As long as people go, what a wonderful job you did, Troy, fixing my car. But you have that person run over Troy with his car? And I guarantee you, Troy, I'll have a few choice words for him because we all would. But not Jesus. They nailed Jesus to a cross. They flogged him. That's the word of God they're doing that to. They spit in his face. That's the word of God they're doing that to. And the reason he could withstand all that was because he was trusting that God who is the righteous judge would administer the right judgment when necessary and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness you see he came down here so we could see his glory glory of a God who loves people and wants to help people and wants to get people out of sin and to live a life of righteousness. To live a life that helps, that's productive, that's beneficial, that helps people do what's right. Not that says, I'm right and you're wrong. Look at how good I am. And it says, for by his wounds, you were healed. We saw his glory because he came manifesting the glory of God. Verse 14 says, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, he manifested God's love when he came into this world. He says, you guys are afraid of me, but I love you. He says, you guys think I'm arrogant, but I love you. By the way, have you, ever, have you ever known your children to think you're arrogant or you're or you're proud or you're unfair? You ever had one sibling say, well, you don't treat the other one like this? Well, no, I don't. That's because I love him and I love you and you're both different people. And therefore I treat you different sometimes because each one of you have a different character and a different personality but I do it because I love you. He manifested God's love. You know the verse John 3, 16, right? Why did God send his son? Because he loved 
the world. He didn't send Jesus into the world because he wanted to condemn the world and destroy the world. He sent Jesus into the world because he loves the world. And God being the source of life and light has given us the choice to desire to follow him or not or to serve him or not. But he says there's consequences when you eat the fruit of not serving me. You're going to die. Because without God, everything dies. Only in God will things live. But God won't force anybody to trust him or believe in him. And why is that? Because he loves them. Because he gave us the ability to believe if we want to. And so it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In 1 John chapter 3, in verse 16, it says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In, John, in uh, 1 John 4, in verse 7, it says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, and the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. How do we know love? By Jesus. How do we know what love does? By Jesus. How do we know how God feels about us? By Jesus. How do we know what God wants from us? Look at Jesus. How do we know God? Look at Jesus. Because he's manifesting the glory of God. And 1 John 4 and verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us and we beheld his glory glories of the only begotten full of grace and truth because god speaks peace to his people in psalm 85 and verse 8 you might want to read the whole psalm but verse 8 says i will hear what god the lord will say for he will speak peace to his people to his godly ones but let them not turn back to folly. God says, I want you to live in peace. But if you turn to folly, if you turn to false gods, there's no peace in false gods. You're going to end up dying. If you turn to some philosophy of the world instead of believing in God, you're not going to live. That philosophy won't get you to live past physical life. You're going to die. Only God can, and he speaks peace to us. And then you have this phrase where it says, glories of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth. And some people go, yeah, Jesus had grace and we have truth. No, no, you misunderstand this. Yes, God is true, and yes, God has grace. But this phrase, the phrase grace and truth, is a Hebrew expression. It, it's set in the heart of, of the Hebrew a, a theology and in the Hebrew language they don't have phrases to, ex to explain this like you and I do when we say he's truly gracious is the way we would say it in their vernacular they would say he's grace and truth that expression grace and truth means that God is truly gracious if you want to see true grace then you look at Jesus. This isn't saying if you want to look at correct facts, look at Jesus. Although Jesus won't lie to you, and Jesus is true and does have truth, what this is telling us is if you want to see what real grace looks like, don't look at your mother and don't look at your father. Look at Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has true grace. What human do you know that has ever measured up to the standard of Jesus? 
Nobody. You want to see true grace? Then you look at Jesus. That's what this expression is saying. Is that in Jesus we have true grace. Because God wants us to understand that that's his name. In Exodus chapter 33, which follows the children of Israel being extricated from Egypt, and then coming to the mountain, and Moses going up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, and before he came down, the children of Israel had made a golden calf, and were worshiping it. And were committed at committing acts of lewdness, which is what they would do in their idolatrous worship. And God told Moses, you go down there and you stop those people because I'm going to kill them. I want to kill them. And Moses intercedes for the people and says, no, Lord, don't. And as Moses is talking with God after these events, he says to him in Exodus chapter 33, and down here at verse 12, and I would suggest to you that if you have a Bible, you pull it out and read it with me, that you look at it. Don't just listen to it. Let the words of God penetrate into your heart. It says, then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say, uh, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not, let, uh, have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses says, Lord, you want me to lead these people, but you haven't told me who's going to go with me. Are you going to go with me? How's this going to happen? And he says, Moses says to God, God, I want to know your ways. I want to know how you are. I want to know you. And it says in verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. You get it? God has always been wanting to give us rest. And the only way we get rest is if God goes with us. See, Adam and Eve had rest in the garden until they bit that fruit. And then when they bit the fruit, it caused them all kinds of turmoil and emotional problems. Then he said to him, Moses says to him, if your presence goes with us, do not, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it, it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us? So that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the peop other people's who are upon the face of the earth. You want to be distinguished, then you get to know God and Jesus. In verse 17, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. What did we see in Jesus? The glory. Glory is of the only begotten. Moses says, show me your glory. Look at verse 19. Are you ready? And he said, God said, I myself will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And we read that last statement and we say, oh, yeah, God's going to be compassionate to the people that he wants. And God is going to be gracious to the people that he wants. And the people that he doesn't want, he's going to destroy. No, that's not what those phrases mean. When it says, I will be compassionate on whom I will be compassionate, God is saying, I will be so compassionate on that person to whom I'm compassionate, you won't believe it. And I will be so gracious to that person on whom I am gracious, you won't believe it. He says, you want to know who I am? You want to know who, what my glory is? You want to know what I love to do? I love 
to be good to people. I love to be compassionate to people. I love to be gracious to people. And to indicate his compassion, his greatness, he says in verse 20, but he said to him, you cannot see my face. For no man can see me and live. God says, I'm going to be compassionate and gracious, but I know your limits. And your limits will not allow me to manifest myself totally to you or you'll be dead. And I love you too much to kill you. And then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. And you shall stand there on the, uh, on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. And by the way, we have a song that's called the cleft of the rock because the rock is Jesus. And when we're in the rock, then we can be in the presence of God. And he says, then I will take my hand away and you shall see my backside, but my face shall not be seen. And then in chapter seven, we have God giving Moses back the Ten Commandments for the second time, and he proclaims his name beginning at verse 5 of chapter 34, and it says, And the Lord descended in the clouds and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity and transgressions and sins. Yet he will not, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, bidding the iniquity of the fathers on their children, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. You see, compassion and goodness is only proper or only possible if there is consequences to not having it. But Jesus says, I'll forgive people for a thousand generations, but I'm going to punish for a couple people who don't listen to me. Why? Because the grace of God and the glory of God is not the destruction of the wicked. The glory of God is the saving of mankind. That's what God wants. That's the glory that we saw in Jesus. And that's why John says in John chapter 1 and verse 3, how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Did you get it? God says, I want you as my children. I've done everything to make you my children. I want you to be part of my family. He says, you don't know how much I love you. But I want you. And such we are. John was writing to the church. And those people that have been called out of the world to follow God, they are such. They are children of God. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it does not know him. His love is so great, he offers sonship to us. And Jesus became flesh to manifest the glory of God. You see, God spoke creation into existence by his word. And the word has a vested interest in what God do, uh, in what goes on here and with you individually. And since the world didn't believe him, he came into the world. He came into this world to lead us out of darkness. 
And so those who see the grace of God in Jesus and want to be part of God's family are born of water in the spirit when baptized in his name, in the name of the word. So we're going to sing song number 301 to remind us that we need to be saved. And Jesus came to do that and was manifest in the flesh in order to do that. Song number 301. Good morning, Saints. A couple of announcements. Um, not only do I put out the We Worship programs every week, I also put out the adult programs similar. It's got videos and stuff like that. It's for older kids and adults. But I want to say the We program, uh, I put it out, but the credit really goes to Sister Chris Moore, uh, Larry Crawford, and Brother Martha Crawford. Uh, they showed me what elements to put into the We Worship program. I don't just build upon that, but Sister Martha is one of the most creative people I've ever seen. Uh, secondly, the, um, uh, the adult program this morning has, it's called The Substance of Faith, three videos, a prayer, other stuff. It's really nice. And the portrayals and the backgrounds of these actors is unbelievable. It's uh, it's called it's, it showed the, the the killing of Stevens, Stephens, uh, the substance of faith, and Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And thirdly, I want to say I'm so excited I could spit, because my great my granddaughter had my great granddaughter on the 11th of this month. So so far I have three grown daughters, three grown grandsons. 
a great a grown granddaughter, uh, a great grandson, five now, a great granddaughter. What's remarkable? I'm the only child. So how did this happen? I went to the doctor. The doctor, I said, I want a DNA. He said, Sandy, you know what a DNA stands for? What? Dad's new additions. <laughs> Let us pray, please. Lord, receive us with open arms upon our entry into your eternal heaven when the hour of our departure draws near. For we have proclaimed your name amongst those who do not know Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We have visited the sick, orphans without mother and father, and came to the aid of widows in need of sustenance. We've strived hard to keep ourselves free from sin. But when we stray from the path of righteousness, we are quick to come to the throne of grace and ask for mercy and forgiveness in our hour of need. And when we met with disaster in our forward motion towards the sight of heaven through our faith in our Lord, whether from illness or any other form of setback, we did not weaken in will, nor give up the fight to overcome the adversity. But all we said was, our Lord, forgive us our sins and anything we might have done that transgressed our duty. Establish our feet firmly. Help us to against those who resist faith. And we did see your deliverance from our stress and in renewed our strength to continue to carry on the fight against evil and with renewed vigor pushed forward the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in an effort to free the souls of men from the clutches of the evil one and his tribe. For we are unstoppable soldiers in the army of the Lord and will turn away from none in our fight for the souls of men. We've given to the poor and those who are out of the way. We've given needed relief to the strangers and sojourners who crossed our daily path, if only for a day, half a day, or any other marriage of time. But we are the caretakers of men, and as our Savior did, so do we. We do not forsake the assembly of the saints of our own accord, lest it be for illness or that which is unforeseen that halted our attendance with those of like faith in the house of God, this house of God. At all times, we strive with relentless effort to preserve our souls in keeping with the commandments of heaven and make every effort to preserve our names in the book of life. We do not know if the book of life has only the names of each of our saints as the only inscription on its pages of account and recorded deeds thereon. But this we do ask of you, O God, that next to the names of each and every saint in Jesus, wherever they be, whether past or present, here or fighting the fight of faith in foreign lands, we ask that the following inscription be added to our name that at all times their eyes were watching God. Amen. Let me give you a couple of announcements. Let me stop this here. And then I'll give you a couple of announcements that I just received. <clears throat> 